using the very same principles behind acoustic telephones that we all experimented with as young scientists. We can develop an acoustic system to move mass via acoustic waves. The wire is particularly useful when the mass to be moved is far from the source of vibration. The acoustic energy travels more efficiently through the metal wire than it does through air or wood. Here I have one tuning fork that is centered to active resonance by a magnet solenoid combination. The vibrations are then carried through the wire to the passive tuning fork at the other end that is mounted in the wood, allowing it to move via surface acoustic waves. Even if the mass didn't move on its own, it would still be easier to move because of acoustic lubrication. Without the tuning fork, energy transmission would be less efficient. The tuning fork essentially acts as a radio receiver tuned to a particular station transmitting frequency. In such a condition, maximum energy is transmitted between transmitter and receiver. Since the active fork is made of non-ferrous metal, I can't efficiently stimulate it directly with a solenoid. Instead, I placed a few small disc magnets on one of the tines, which interact with the solenoid. But adding weight to a vibrating object usually lowers its resonant frequency. So magnets have been placed on one of the tines of the passive fork as well, in the attempt to match the loading and resulting frequency reduction of the active fork. The effect would still work without the wire, provided the system is properly tuned. The passive tuning fork mass combination represents a stone which has been tuned to a specific frequency. For stone levitation or propulsion to work, the idea is that you have to find the natural frequency, or what acoustic researcher John Warrell Keeley called the mass chord of the mass, and then play that note or chord with a sonic instrument or a transmitter. But finding the natural frequencies of a stone or cutting it to vibrate at certain frequencies is likely a challenging feat in and of itself. An alternative might be to mount a passive receiver into or onto the mass to be moved, just like the passive tuning fork is mounted into the wooden plank here. Even still, this might not be as effective as a tuned stone, because untuned masses might attenuate the vibrations. Perhaps this is one of the reasons, in addition to the aesthetic and structural ones, that the ancient builders had to cut their stones so precisely. If anything, it is certainly a testament to their skills. On the more metaphysical side, we might certainly see how operators of such an energy field technique will become entrained to these immersive frequencies, just as with the mass of stone they are trying to move. Their brain waves and bodily rhythms gradually becoming tuned to a singular sustained frequency tone or chord representing the mass. This concept may be the embodiment of what metaphysicists mean by achieving sympathetic resonance with stone and establishing coherence with sound fields. In other words, nothing is separate in the universe. Everything is ultimately connected by vibration. In this case, the ideas of mystics might not be as far out as once thought. Perhaps today's metaphysics will become tomorrow's physics. The main caveat with acoustic systems is that all of the elements must be tuned to the same frequency or harmonics of that frequency for maximum acoustic energy transfer and utilization. This is what is meant by coherence. Reportedly, John Keeley's acoustic systems were so finely tuned that even the slightest discordant elements in the environment could interfere with and mitigate their operations. Some believe this is why he was not able to adapt his devices for commercial use. But the sources of sound that Keeley used were often small musical instruments, each grouped with a number of resonators for amplification of both strength and frequency. Because they were so finely tuned, the resonators were probably able to accumulate and sustain tremendous amounts of energy with very few losses, as is the case with most machines. An example of such a finely tuned resonator is this massive gong. Notice the tremendous acoustic energy that is reverberating and gradually increasing in strength throughout the material. The wavefront from each incoming tap building upon the accumulated wavefronts from the preceding taps. 
as this energy could be built up over some time and then suddenly released all at once, it would amount to a powerful force. The equation relating power and energy shows us that the faster the accumulated energy is released, the more power is produced. Acoustic resonators are essentially capacitive for vibrational energy, but the need for such fine tuning as in Keeley's devices could potentially limit applications of such a system outside of a controlled environment. Perhaps he could have rectified these issues by using much more powerful sound generators. Energy levels several orders larger may have been able to overcome the losses due to environmental incoherence. Needless to say, much more research has to be done. The effects here may seem feeble, but we must remember that our first modern battery produced only two volts, despite being two feet tall, and generated barely enough current to dimly light up a few of today's small LEDs. Nevertheless, this was the beginning of modern electrical technology, and despite its feebleness, was groundbreaking at the time. Now we have batteries that are powerful enough to directly power the motor of an electric car. When the technical issues of frequency generation are rectified, sound technology could undoubtedly achieve the same increase in efficacy and practicality as electromagnetism. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay tuned.